All right, so we are right at about 6.30 right now, so now is as good a time as any uh, to get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Coal and Communities Town Hall. My name is Grace Fork, and I am one of the conservation staff at the Alberta Wilderness Association, as well as I get to play the role of your esteemed moderator for this evening. Uh, if you're not familiar with the AWA, we are a nonprofit wilderness conservation organization. We are based out of Calgary, uh, but we're actually founded all the way in the Crow's Nest Pass uh, by a group of people who are just looking at the eastern slopes back in 1965 and they were concerned about what they saw. So we're really going back to our roots tonight in talking about coal and communities and in looking at some of the major developments which are happening in the Crow's Nest Pass like the Grassy Mountain Project. Uh, so before getting started I'm going to start off with a few housekeeping notes. Uh, you'll notice that as participants, you are muted and you have your cameras off tonight. However, do not let this stop you from using the chat. We would love to know where you're coming from. Uh, we would love to see you saying hi, as well as uh, we are going to be having a discussion at the end of our four uh, panel presentations this evening. And so please do use the chat to drop your questions in there throughout the four presentations. We're going to be collecting them. Uh, and one thing that would be really helpful is if you just let us know if your question is directed towards a particular presenter or if it be, could be covered by any one of our four panelists. All right, so we are also recording tonight's presentation. Uh, so if you miss anything that one of the panelists said, no worries, it is going to be uploaded to AWA's YouTube account uh, sometime tomorrow, as well as you can also find the link on our website at albertawilderness.ca. So those of us who are located uh, at AWA headquarters are joining you tonight from Mokinstis. And this is the Blackfoot word for the joining of the Bow and Elbow Rivers, as well as an incredibly important gathering place for the Blackfoot peoples. So we're symbolically or maybe digitally coming together tonight on Treaty 7 territories, uh, which are the traditional and current territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, uh, which includes the Siksika, the Pikani, and the Gaina First Nations as well as the Sutina and the Stony Nakoda, which includes the Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Wesley Nations, as well as Mokinstis is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. So one thing I'm gonna encourage you to do is don't let your engagement with this stop at listening to a land acknowledgement. Uh, if you're located outside of Treaty 7, I'm actually gonna drop uh, a really great map into the chat right now, uh, where you can explore all of the territories and the languages um, and the treaties, which are found all across Canada, as well as, you know, just take a moment to yourself to consider how we can support our Indigenous friends and colleagues as they continue to steward many of the important uh, headwaters and the landscapes that surround us. So this is actually the third town hall that we've held in conjunction with the Coal Policy Working Group, uh, which is a collaborative of conservation groups and landowners and concerned individuals who uh, want to address the health, ecosystem, and social impacts of coal development on Alberta's eastern slopes. And the theme of tonight's hall, sorry, the theme of tonight's town hall is community. And in exploring this, I kind of wanted to start out by talking uh, about ecological communities. Uh, because when we, when we talk about our ecosystems, so often we're going back to this theme of connectedness or interdependence, where we have these networks of biotic factors or living things uh, like animals and plants and decomposers that are intrinsically or inextricably connected to abiotic or non-living things like the soil and the water and the air. And communities of people are, are no different from that. You know, so often now we're kind of feeling a little more disconnected from our landscapes and from our headwaters. And we forget that we're actually part of this much larger biological community and that our fate and that our well-being is tied to the health of our headwaters, to the health of our landscapes and our wildlife. And so we're gonna have a lot of really great uh, reminders of that tonight from our four excellent speakers. Uh, so we'll start off the night with a presentation uh, by Latasha Cafro, who's from the Nitsitipi Water Protectors. Uh, that will be followed up by a presentation uh, by Heather Davis, uh, who is from the Crow's Nest Pass and owns an adventure-based business there. Uh, we'll have Stephanie Duarte Pedrosa, um, speaking to us about what it's like to be a young person growing up in the Crow's Nest Pass, 
looking ahead at your future and, and kind of in the shadow of coal development, where do we go next from there? And finally, uh, Moira Davis, or sorry, <laughs> Moira Williams, apologies, Moira, uh, is going to take things home with some perspectives from the Galilee Basin in Queensland, Australia, where they have already seen coal development or coal proposals in a very similar way and had uh, grassroots organizers coming together in order to be able to push back on that. So I'm really excited to hear from you, Moira, especially since we're, we're gonna have some important lessons learned for right here in Alberta. Uh, so with that, I am going to pass things off to Latasha. As I said, uh, Latasha is uh, actually a co-founder of the Mississippi Water Protectors and is also a proud Ganaki from the Blood Reserve. So with that being said, uh, Latasha, feel free. I will stop sharing my screen now. Feel free to take it away. Let me just make sure. Sorry, everyone. Latasha, have I given you the appropriate permissions in order to share your screen? Just give me one moment. I think we might be running into a little bit of a technical difficulty here. Sorry, everyone. Might have lost the connection with Latasha. That being the case, perhaps right now would be a good time to, oh, here she is. All right, <laughs> we're just gonna allow her to join us one more time. Sorry, everyone. It wouldn't be a Zoom event without a couple technological difficulties. So we really appreciate your patience. All right, here we go. All right, Latasha, we are glad to have you back. Can you hear us okay? And are you able to share your screen? Yes, can you all hear me okay? My yes. laptop's Yes, really you funny. sound great. No okay. worries. One second. All right, well, thanks everybody for tuning in tonight. Um, so, okay, the soap club. The still honest, the Matomoko Motsaki, Nin Anista Kitokiapi, Nixist Anista Saksi Sanaki, Nox Anista Agapi Ginapiaki, No Dutu Gana. Um, my name is Latasha Kafrobe, and I am a member of the Blood Tribe um, that's currently located in Southern Alberta. Um, some of you may also recognize me from it to be water protectors as well. I am one of the um, co-founders of that small um, First Nations collective. So I'm here today, the theme of our conversation is about coal and communities. And I'm here to talk about some of my concerns, being a member of many communities, being a member of the Blood Tribe, being somebody who resides in Southern Alberta, being somebody who has participated in ceremonies and language revitalization, being a part of a parenting community, somebody who's raising children in this beautiful area, um, being a part of generations of Hitsitipi people who have lived and occupied and stewarded this area since time immemorial. Um, and just like many of you, being a concerned, a concerned resident of this area, somebody who has strong and deep connections um, whatever that may be, whether you are somebody who enjoys hiking <laughs> out in these area, somebody who enjoys fishing, or you're somebody like, um, like me who practices their traditional and treaty rights in this area. So before we get too far, I wanted to kind of situate where I come from. So I come from the Blood Reserve, um, which is one of the nations of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Um, I grew up on the Blood Reserve um, really close to water to national parks area. Um, so as you can see, I have a photo of Chief Mountain there. That's one of the mountain landscapes that I'm most um, familiar with because it was right in my backyard. You could actually see it no matter what window you looked out of, of my house. Um, one of the photos there is of me and my siblings actually swimming in the Old Man River, um, which borders the north end of the Blood Reserve. Um, yes, we're swimming in all of our clothes. Um, and then some other photos of my family, as you can see, as we grew up 
I grew up right where the, um, the foothills meet the plains. So these areas have been a really big part of my life because they signify where home is. The mountain range, um, the porcupine hills, this is, this is home to me and this is where my children um, call home and this is where my future generations will also call home as well. It's also really important to me because this is where my people have stewarded and occupied since time immemorial. This area of land here, um, before it was referred to as Treaty 7, um, is the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy. The Blackfoot Confederacy, like I mentioned, consists of the um, Ghana First Nation where I am from, the Siksaga, the Bigani, and Amskapi Bigani, um, otherwise known as the Blackfeet, who currently reside on the other side of the U.S. border. So as you can see from this image here, our territory was quite large. Um, and, and remains quite large. And for, for centuries, we have occupied this land and taken care of it and all of the um, life and animals that reside in this area, including, including the water and these important watersheds, such as the Old Man Watershed. These areas hold a lot of life. They also hold a lot of sacredness um, because of where they are and because of the meaning of these landscapes to the Blackfoot people. Unfortunately, there's this big, terrible thing, um, such as these open pit coal mines that are coming to this area. Um, as you can see here, these are some photos of the Elk Valley mines that are a hop, skip, and a jump just on the other side of the BC border. And they can be quite devastating to the landscape. Um, to reiterate some words, that you cannot rebuild a mountain. Once these areas are destroyed, there's no putting them back. Many of you may have driven through places like um, why, why is it so big? My name is right in the crow's nest past there. Um, driving by places such as Frank's Slide. If you could rebuild a mountain, I'm sure they would have picked that mountain and put it back up um, if they could. Here's another image of what an open pit coal mine looks like, again, from the Elk Valley. This is what's coming to the area. And so when we talk about communities, there's so many impacts of what these projects um, not may have, but what they will have if they're approved. So bringing it back to this area, we said there's a majority of the new proposed mines in Southern Alberta fall within traditional Blackfoot territory, many of them falling within the Treaty 7 region as well. And so the work of Mississippi Water Protectors has been primarily focusing on these projects that are situated in the southwest corner of Alberta. I will also note that coal doesn't just impact Southern Alberta. With the rescission of the coal policy, it has also allowed for numerous um, exploration and projects to, to advance um, in central Alberta as well. And there's other mines um, such as thermal coal mines that have been impacting um, treaty regions and First Nations across Alberta for a really long time. So this isn't a new issue, but it's one that requires a lot of attention right now. And this big push on met coal um, is something we should all be concerned about. As you can see from this image here, these mines are really closely situated to First Nations um, reserves right now as well. The Bigani being the closest, um, and then the Blood Tribe where I am from being the second closest reserve, both of which rely on the Old Man River for essential waters. Here's some other maps um, that depict kind of where these projects will be situated. And so you can see a number of towns um, of people downstream that will be impacted, including places like Pinter Creek and Fort McLeod and Lethbridge, um, all the way down, like I said, the water keeps on flowing. And I think it's really important to just remind ourselves that even when water is contaminated, it doesn't stop flowing. It'll carry those contaminants as far as it can downstream. So it's really important to stop these things at their source. Um, lots of these projects, well, all of these projects are located in the headwaters, which is the places of origins for much of our essential drinking water for anyone who resides in, in Southern Alberta. So the impacts of coal are many. And it should be noted that regardless of what community you come from, these will be felt in different ways. Speaking today from a First Nations perspective, I have this endless list of concerns and potential impacts. And like I said, it's not if these will happen, it's when they will happen. 
And there's lots of them, anything from the health and wellness of our communities, from um, physical health to how will these projects impact long-term stability. There's lots of talk about jobs. Um, and if these, pro these pro promising that these projects will bring jobs to First Nations communities. But I think lots of people have forgot to ask the question of, are these the types of jobs that First Nations want? Um, being from a member of one of these communities, I don't want to work for a coal mine. I spent a lot of time going to school. I spent a lot of time um, working to get educated in both traditional and Western knowledge to give back to my community. And working for a coal mine is not the type of job that is going to better myself or better my community. Looking at other things like air and water quality, these are things that are universal that will affect anybody downstream and in the area, as well as decrease in livelihood and how that may be felt. Thinking about First Nations rights and what that looks like is also really important to the conversation as many of these coal activities and exploration are already infringing on First Nations rights, which I'll get to in just a moment here. So when we think about the communities that we're a part of, I think it's really important to think about the values that you share with your community. Think about the ideologies and the stories and what is really tied to these areas of land. I was fortunate enough to grow up with my grandmothers, um, with, with elders from my community to hear lots of the stories of the land to hear the language being spoken, to be brought out to these places that hold such beauty, such energy and such life, to grow up um, and to live off the sustenance that these areas provide. And to really grow up with that First Nations worldview of all land is sacred. And these are some of the values that you find not only within the Blackfoot Confederacy, um, but that are held by many First Nations and by many people. And it's, looking at those values, it's important to challenge these things and say that all land is sacred. The 1976 coal policy, while it was important in its entirety, it did categorize land, which is not a First Nations um, world of view. All land is sacred, and whether it's category two or category four, it does not, um, it should not be eligible for such molestation, such as coal mining. These areas, when I think about my community, are really important to our survival, both our physical survival, but also the survival of our culture and our way of life. Like I mentioned earlier, our creation stories, as it's said to be as Blackfoot, are rooted in this area and come from the land. Our stories, our governance systems are all based off the animals and the landscapes that help to form that. They are inseparable and many First Nations have this intimate relationship with the land, which means whenever there is some type of large development like this are things that increase, um, in, increase the increased climate change, it is felt more deeply by First Nations because of that intimate relationship with the land, water sources and life. So really, when we look at these projects, it is quite a visceral attack against our way of life, our ceremonies, how we gather, where we gather, who we gather with. And that really transmits to our children as well, because while we have seen the ongoing genocide in, in Canada through various forms, such as residential schools, the 60s scoop, we see genocide in the form of land degradation as well, such as the introduction of coal mines or large um, resource extraction projects. These are also acts of genocide because they do um, try to sever that relationship that First Nations have with the land. And it is those relationships that, in, that ensure the, um, the survival and thriving of our ways of life, the ways of life that our ancestors have lived since time immemorial. And that is a right that is not granted by Western law, but is, is granted from a higher source. Um, and so it's important when we think about our future generations and our children having the opportunity to live their lives um, in ways that are meaningful to them. So going down the, the talk of Indigenous rights, these projects are current projects um, both whether they're in exploration or in the application process 
um, cause a severe threat to First Nations rights, both treaty um, and Aboriginal rights. So like I'd mentioned earlier, these projects um, in Southern Alberta, majority, majority of them are situated in the Treaty 7 area. Um, as part of the signing of Treaty 7, we agreed to share the land, not to own the land, but to share for the wealth and prosperity of all. And that includes, um, and from a First Nations perspective, we agreed to, to live um, in harmony with one another. These were not land surrender treaties. These were peace and friendship treaties to ensure that we all had a good life in this area and not to um, infringe on each, other, on each other's rights to practice our traditional ways of life. These projects, like I said, will have major impacts on the right to hunt, fish, trap, gather, harvest in the lands that First Nations have since time immemorial. Um, it also is really critical to look at treaty relations and being in good treaty relations with one another as Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. These mines not only impact the Treaty 7 area, but multiple treaty areas across Canada as water, I said, <laughs> continuously flows um, across the prairie provinces. Um, in Alberta alone, there are three treaty areas, Treaty 6, 7, and 8, and over 45 um, First Nations groups in Alberta, First Nations communities. That's not including Métis settlements um, or non-federally recognized um, First Nations groups. So when we think about Treaty 7, this is a nation-to-nation -nation agreement. This is a nation-to-nation -nation relationship that needs to be fostered and upheld. And the development of coal is not fostering or honoring those relationships. Treaty, again, was agreed to to the depth of a European plow. Coal lies much deeper than the depth of a European plow and therefore was not negotiated in Treaty 7. Um, just again, all of the different treaty areas in Alberta and kind of mapping out where all the different um, First Nations groups that are situated in Alberta. So I encourage you to look at what's important to you and the communities that you're a part of. Water is truly life, and I don't say this to sound cliche. I say it because it is something that connects all of us as living beings. It's something that flows through each and every one of us, and these areas are sacred to many and sacred for many different reasons. Whether you are a hiker who goes to these places for your mental and physical well-being, whether you are a First Nations child who is connecting to the land and picking medicines with your grandmother. These areas are important to sustain and maintain, and these areas are crucial to us all. These areas hold so much life, um, and as, first, as, as anybody, it is not, we do not have the power to destroy things that we did not create. And I quote that from Mike Brucehead of, of the Broad Reserve, who has reiterated that time and time again. We as human beings do not have the right to destroy things that we did not create. We did not create the mountains. We did not create um, the Old Man River. It is our job to steward these lands to, just, to ensure that they continue to provide for all of our future generations. I encourage you to take action. There's so much that you can do even, a pan, even in a pandemic. Take action from your homes, from your, you know, all you really need is a laptop <laughs> um, or your phone. You can make those calls to the members of your community and inform them of why it's important to take action. Inform them of what's coming. Find different ways and be creative. We are not sit to be. We all, and if you're not indigenous, you are treaty people, which means we all have an obligation um, to protect the land, air, and water in these areas that we reside in. We have a responsibility to our children and our future generations by protecting the land, by honoring treaty, we are ensuring a prosperous future for all of our children um, to live on and enjoy the beautiful areas that we now all call home here in Southern Alberta um, and across Alberta. So I will hand it back to Grace. Thank you. Thank you so much, Latasha. That was a really excellent presentation and a lot of good reminders. I especially appreciated that quote that you took from, from Mike Brewsthead and, and shared with us all. Uh, we can't destroy the things that we didn't create. 
Uh, so next, I am really excited to invite Heather Davis uh, as our next presenter. So a quick intro, uh, Heather is a business owner in the Crow's Nest Pass, operating a small professional guiding outfit. She is passionate about our eastern slopes and connecting people to the outdoors and studied business marketing and biological sciences at NATE, environmental and conservation sciences at U of A, and previously worked in environmental consulting and for Alberta Environment and Parks. She's got a really great background and she presented during the Grassy Mountain Public Hearing with Crow's Nest Conservation uh, in regards to the growth of outdoor recreation in the Crow's Nest Pass. So Heather, you have some really great photos for us. I'm really excited to hear from you, so feel free to take it away. Awesome, thank you so much, Grace. Thank you, Latasha, for that amazing, amazing um, presentation. It was wonderful to hear your perspective and how we do really need to make sure that it's our responsibility to protect um, this land. So I'm just going to, uh, I want to share my screen with everyone first so that you can see all of my photos. <laughs> uh, all right, give me a second here. All right, I believe everyone should be able to see this now. All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, good evening. Thank you so much for coming tonight and listening to my perspective. Um, as Grace said, I spoke during the Grassy Mountain hearing and I would like to share with you my perspective on the growing outdoor recreation industry here in Crow's Nest Pass. Today, I will be sharing my story, uh, information about outdoor recreation. And as I present, I want to showcase with you uh, many photos of this area. So I moved to Crow's Nest Pass the summer of 2014 to work for Alberta Environment and Parks, leading their south portion of the Backcountry Trails Flood Rehabilitation Program, where our team reconstructed backcountry trails and riparian areas. Prior to moving to the mountains, I worked in oil and gas, both in the oil sands and in conventional gas, completing reclamation and remediation projects as a professional agrologist. I would spend my spare time traveling to the mountains and even tour guide it for a ski and snowboard company, taking people to the mountains in both the US and Canada. The mountains for me are a special place and they hold a special place for recreation, for healing and sustainability for now and into the future. The mountains have helped me heal personally from both abuse and trauma. And I know that that is the same for a lot of other people. Crow's Nest Pass is very much a part of the Canadian Rockies. And I talk a lot about Crow's Nest Pass because that is just where I am. But I know that other mountains and other parts of the eastern slopes are being impacted by these coal mines. Um, so Crow's Nest Pass is very much part of the Canadian Rockies and a place where myself and others feel connected to the landscape. In March 2000. 18, after winning a Provincial Growing Rural Tourism Award, I started my own business um, and I now hold several titles, which include an environmental scientist, professional guide with two highly recognized organizations, and an entrepreneur. Um, I'm also a board member with the Crozens Conservation Society, the Parks and Rec Authority Board with our municipality, and I sit on an access and stewardship committee with the Association of Canadian Mountain Guides. So this stuff is definitely up my alley. <laughs> um, I started my own business for many reasons. And one of those reasons was that I saw a lot of opportunity to grow a sustainable economic driver in a community that I love and a community that felt like they wanted to have more economic drive. I wanted to be able to provide employment and quality jobs for residents within my community. I have started this grassroots business in a community where I was the first professional guide with the Association of Canadian Mountain Guides and knew that I could be instrumental in growing a professional career for myself and others in guiding. While I, only, while I have only been in business briefly, I currently employ myself. Um, I also am going to be mentoring five other ACMG guides this summer. Uh, some of them are already guides, uh, professional guides, and some of them are going through the process of becoming a guide. Uh, we have, I have one wilderness first aid instructor, and then two interpretive guides 
that are starting off as well. Uh, so it's a fast growing team and I'm really excited about that. Uh, and so we have a lot of new people coming on and, and I'm trying to encourage uh, local people to get involved in this profession as well. Uh, I do work with several business partners, nonprofit groups, and I work with schools as well. To express how this industry is growing, even during a pandemic um, and being shut down for three months at the beginning of the pandemic, my business grew by 125% over the spring and summer. And if I calculate how well we did over the winter, it would probably even be more than 125%. But I, I just, I haven't even had time to sit down and figure out, figure out those numbers. Um, I believe in this area so much uh, and I want to be able to offer nature-based and adventure-based tourism in this area. And I am not alone as there are several other businesses who have started uh, ventures in this area and, and provide employment in the community for this growing industry. While I cannot speak for the opinions of um, other groups or other business owners, I will simply speak on what is currently occurring in our community regarding outdoor recreation. Uh, here are some examples from our community. So there is a local uh, club called United Riders of Crow's Nest Pass, and they're a local mountain bike club and they surfaced probably just over 10 years ago and they have built world recognized sustainable mountain bike trails. The momentum for mountain biking in Crow's Nest Pass has increased substantially over the last five years. And in 2020, their trail counters showed a 100% increase on their mountain bike trails. To add value, because a lot of times um, you hear with the coal mines that it's gonna provide high paying jobs, um, so this is why I talk so much about the economic um, parts about tourism. I mean, don't get me wrong, I think that there are other, other consequences to tourism as well, and, and those need to be addressed as well. But um, I do talk a lot about the economic driver, and that's just because I'm, I'm comparing industries. So to add value behind the economic driver of mountain biking, there are currently well, when I did the Grassy Mountain hearing, um, there were three local businesses, but now there's another one. So there are now four local businesses through retail, mechanics, coaching, and tours that exist in Crow's Nest Pass. Uh, events have resulted because of these trails, which bring tourists to town. In 2019, four mountain bike races came to Crow's Nest Pass that attract people from across Canada. Trail running has contributed significantly to the economics of Crow's Nest Pass and to mountain culture in this area. A big driver for the community, um, for this community of runners stems from the largest ultra marathon in Canada. This race is 162 kilometers long, <laughs> which is insane. Um, and it goes and intertwines throughout the backcountry and around Crow's Nest Pass. While this isn't the only race the company directs, the company is based in Crow's Nest Pass and provides full-time employment for staff and several seasonal jobs locally. Uh, the race brings in racers and their race supporters, such as friends and family to this community. On the weekend of the race, it is almost always impossible to find a room at any local hotel or B&B. These events attract more people to the community and some of them buy homes afterwards um, and become full-time or part-time part -time residents. Myself is included in that as I ran the race in 2012 and then I moved here in 2014. To add the economic value behind trail running, there are currently two local businesses through retail and distribution that exist in Crow's Nest Pass. Events and businesses have surfaced as a result, including a race, another race that is the only North American stop on the Sky Race series. Three main races that attract visitors and then some smaller races exist here. Um, but they all help to foster a mountain culture in this town. So this photo, so, so hiking, scrambling and backpacking is growing in popularity in this region. Um, and this photo was taken at the top of Turtle Mountain. And some of you may know Turtle Mountain as Frank Slide. So this is just the other side of the Frank Slide. And on that side um, is the, the slide itself. Um, so the slide, Turtle Mountain slid in 1903 
And that's what we know as, of as Frank's slide. Across, you can see Crow's Nest Mountain. It's kind of in the clouds in this picture. Um, this is another popular hike, easy scramble that outdoor enthusiasts feel compelled to summit. Um, in the photo, we also see Blairmore and Coleman in the distance and past Powder Keg, which is our local ski hill, is just on the edge. From the two most popular summits in the area, we see the Grassy Mountain Mine. We also see several other parts that will be impacted by proposed mines if they do go through. So Chinook North, um, you might be able to see bits of Chinook South, but definitely Montem's um, property you see in this photo. In 2019, the local hiking club had to start capping the numbers of people who came on trips to manage the size of local participants. The Great Divide Trail, a long distance hiking trail from Waterton to north of Jasper has recently rerouted the section north of Crow's Nest Pass into Alberta along the High Rock Range. And they did this because of all of the coal mines in BC. So they need to reroute their trail so that they can be away from the coal mines. And uh, now they're under threat again. Again, so that's interesting. Um, in 2020, the Great Divide Trail saw around a 225% increase of through hikers using their trail. To add value behind the economic driver of hiking, there are currently at least two local businesses providing guiding and outdoor education such as wilderness first aid courses and avalanche, avalanche safety training that exists here in Crow's Nest Pass. Kids camps, there are a few outdoor kids camps in the region with the Crow's Nest Lake Bible Camp being the main camp uh, located within the municipality of Crow's Nest Pass. They have two locations in the area and have hosted several youth and kid, kids over the decades. Um, and they have hosted several, yes, several youth and kids over the decades. Um, and, and their properties actually butt up right against the coal leases. So that's quite interesting. Um, I believe that their busiest day, so the, the Bible Camp's busiest day in 2019 was 178 kids in the backcountry on one day. They have hundreds of kids at the Bible Camp on a regular year, and they often utilize the public land in the area. Crosnes Pass has world-class fly fishing. The regulation for fly fishing has become very strict in BC and for any guides will come to Alberta to fly fish and not to mention that the fish in BC are declining and largely due to coal mining. Fly fishing guides come down from Calgary to fish and we have several local fly fishing guides and two local fly fishing shops who provide ad added economic drivers to the area. Other activities that I want to include and are a part of outdoor recreation and tourism are, this is fun, bouldering on the Frank slide, which now has around 20, 2,500 problems. When I did the Grassy Mountain hearing, it was 2,000. So now there's an, another 500 problems that they have sorted out. Uh, the slide is now one of the biggest single bouldering areas in Canada with problems of all grades and styles. Uh, there, there is talk about a guidebook uh, being released shortly about these problems. And um, a, a local club, the Southern Alberta Rockies Bouldering Club, hosts an annual Tour de Franc Bouldering Festival every year, well, every non-COVID year. Crow's Nest Pass has world-class caves. This, this hasn't become super popular, I would say, likely due to the technical skills needed to access caves. Historically, caving tours have been offered through local businesses, or sorry, through businesses located outside of Crow's Nest Pass. And hopefully in the future, um, some of our businesses will be able to offer that locally. Ski and snowboarding. So a brief description of our local ski hill, past powder cake. Uh, this is a small ski hill that is managed by our municipality. It offers skiing and snowboarding even at night. It's a great little family hill. I, I, I quite like it. The local ski hill also is a, has, a male, uh, sorry, has a major trail network for mountain bikes. 
From the ski hill, we look directly across the highway and we can see the proposed grassy mountain mine. So if you look, you, you see that first mountain there and then back in the distance before the white capped mountains, that's grassy mountain mine right there. In addition, backcountry ski touring and snowboarding is also growing in the area. Paddling is more popular in the spring when the rivers and creeks are higher. A local club does exist in the area that provides summer camps and hosts a kayaking festival called Three Rivers Rendezvous. Nordic skiing is incredible in the area and a local club exists and snowshoeing is also very popular. So I like this picture, I snowshoed up this mountain on Green Hill. Um, one year I found a bear den that was still occupied um, in the springtime, so I didn't stick around. And, and this area has been seeing a lot of exploration lately as well. And you can see it's, it's very, very close to town. Climbing is also growing in popularity as I notice more routes being set in the region. We also have a local distributor company in the area that distributes climbing gear throughout Canada. And of course, there is golfing, which some of you may have heard about. Um, they received a new clubhouse and the golf course was moved around to make room for Riversdale's loadout. The golf course does not encompass the entirety of outdoor recreation in Crowsness Pass. And I mention that because in the Grassy Mountain um, environmental impact assessment, that was their definition of outdoor recreation. Well, it seemed like their definition of outdoor recreation. As our global trends change again, I strongly believe that we'll see a shift in people working remotely and more people moving to places for lifestyle. And that we are already seeing that now um, with the mountain, time, mountain towns receiving quite a housing boom. I, I suspect that by having an open pit mine this close to town, it will impact the way people feel about moving to a mountain town for its lifestyle and or visiting a community for its adventure and nature-based activities. It is also difficult to say whether or not these businesses and clubs with volunteers will even stay in Crow's Nest Pass once the mine is in operation, or if they'll leave the community I have heard several times that people do not plan to stay if the mine opens up or if several mines open up. Outdoor recreation is a big part of tourism in Crowsness Pass and tour tourism does not revolve around hotels and restaurants. The environmental impact assessment by Grassy Mountain and its socioeconomic section lacked consultation with the local tourism and outdoor recreation community. It appears that the consultant, whoever that was, prepared the report and left a huge gap regarding what is going on in this community. A cost benefit analysis should include an assessment on the outdoor recreation, lifestyle and tourism prior to any mine approvals and even approvals for exploration. As a visitor and outdoor recreationalist to mountain communities myself, I do not visit or recreate at a mountain town with an active open pit mine that is visible from its own town, not to mention several open pit coal mines. This community comment on the declining population, and this must mean it is a dying community. I see it quite differently. I see it as a community that is transforming as people remove the stigma of Crowsness Pass as being a coal mining town and seeing it for being a part of the Canadian Rockies. We are seeing more entrepreneurs and people being creative to build an economy. And if we give people the support and encouragement to do this, this will only grow. As we saw in the past, the Crow's Nest Pass struggled after the last coal mine closed down in the 1980s. I don't want to see this happen again because people are eager to make a quick but short-lived economic boost. I will finish with a letter that Frederick Godsell wrote in 1893 
This was prior to the first coal mine that exists in Crow's Nest Pass on the Alberta side. The Crow's Nest Pass and Waterton Lakes have been for years a common resort for surrounding neighborhood for camping and holiday making, and this being but or, and there being but few such places in the country. I think they should be reserved forever and for the use of the public. Otherwise, a comparatively small number of settlers can control and spoil these public resorts. Every day that is that it is delayed increases the probability of friction between government and settlers that may build in these spots. And that was in 1893, and now it's over 100 years later, and look where we are. So thank you so much, everyone, for listening to my presentation. And I put uh, my email address there if anyone wants to contact me at another time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Heather. That was fantastic. And, and thank you so much for sharing your, your personal connection with these spaces. It was, it was really meaningful. And <laughs> the quote as well, the more things change, the more things stay the same. But I think we're hoping for some important changes coming down the line here, especially, especially as we all get together as a community. Um, so next, I am going to be passing the mic off to Stephanie Duarte Pedrosa uh, to give her an introduction. Stephanie grew up in the Crow's Nest Pass and feels an extreme sense of loyalty to the wilderness surrounding her hometown, much as we've heard with Heather already. Having worked in the tourism and recreation sectors in the Crow's Nest, she knows the potential of her community to pursue an economy beyond natural resource extraction. Uh, she actually attended the university, uh, attended university in the Netherlands, majoring in natural resource management. And because of the global pandemic, I uh, decided to pause her studies to avoid online classes and instead uh, has been working back home at Castle Mountain Ski Resort. Uh, so returning to Crow's Nest in 2020 gave her the incredible opportunity to work with and learn from the great folks at Crow's Nest Conservation Society and she was actually the youngest participant to uh, participate in the Grassy Mountain hearing where she proudly shared her Gen Z perspective. So looking forward to hearing from you Stephanie, feel free to tell your story. Oh yeah we can hear you a little quiet but I think Okay, uh, thank you so Perfect. much for introducing me and thank you Heather and Natasha for what you guys shared. Um, I will be speaking, yeah, similar things to Heather. Heather provided a lot of information about our town and the photos are beautiful. I don't have a, I don't have a PowerPoint, but um, I have lot, lots of sentiments that I would love to express. Um, before, I, before I get into that, I wanna just talk about two quick things. The first is the only reason that I'm speaking here is because Heather and Rick Cook, the president of the Cocos Conservation Society, were able to convince me to participate in the hearing. When they first, like, when they first asked me to speak in the hearing, I was no way, like, I don't, I'm not entitled to an opinion, you know, I don't have a profession or degree, or I don't own any land, like, I don't, I'm not entitled to, to speak formally about, about the mind. Um, and because of their encouragement, I did participate. And now upon reflection, I realized, like we, as like my generation and our age group, like we deserve to have a massive voice when it comes to these projects because these projects have lifespans of like over 20 years and these 20 years align with our, like our generation's most formative years in terms of access to job opportunities. And these projects are really gonna shape the careers that we have access to in, the, in, in Southern Alberta in general, but also like specifically in Crow's Nest. Um, and so, like, yeah, so I guess I also, I'd like to encourage um, other young people to look for opportunities to speak and share their perspectives in formal settings, as well as in like social media and all that fun stuff too. But yeah, but get more engaged in the formal, in the formal processes, such as the permit allocation. Um, yeah, okay, that's one thing. And the other thing I wanted to uh, address is, I will criticize the Grassy Mountain Project and I will criticize, um, the municipality and their tunnel vision, <laughs> but um, in no way is this an attack on the people who work for the coal mines, like in the Elk Valley, in fact, just across the border, like my dad, my dad works there. <laughs> um, and in no way is this a criticism of my friends from high school who've just gotten jobs at the tech mines or up north at Fort McMurray. I totally respect their livelihoods and they work so hard. And I, um, I the thought of like 
being a haul truck driver like on a night shift in February is the most terrifying thing. So they have all my respect. Um, yeah, there we go. So now I want to talk about Grassy Mountain. Um, I was born actually in Seattle, but both my parents are from Edmonton. And when I was young, they kind of gotten set up with a big American city life and they wanted to bring our family into a small town in the in the Rocky Mountains. And so they found Crow's Nest and we moved here when I was nine. Um, and I can't imagine growing up anywhere else. It's so been so influential to how I see the world, how I react with the world, how I interact with the land um, and all the opportunities I've had to, and all the activities I've learned because of the wilderness that surrounds us. And I think kind of going off of what Heather said, um, our access to public lands is incredible in Crow's Nest. I don't, and it wasn't until I left that I realized how lucky we were and how unique our situation is that we have all this crown land that we can do all these activities any day, any hour, um, and for no real charge. Um, my brother, he, um, he camps almost every single weekend in the summer on the crown land with his friends from high school. Like they've already, they're all already started camping this year in the cold. <laughs> um, and I think like our access to these lands for recreation, and I don't think people in our town are truly aware that it's something that's been taken from us and something that's already started to be restricted with the exploratory drilling that's happening that Heather talked about. Um, and I remember like the first time that Rick uh, from Coast of Conservation showed me the maps that showed where all the coal leases were. And like, I, I was shocked and just fully like I had no idea that they could take this. And I felt so, so attacked and so defensive. Like this is, this is ours. But it isn't really ours, I guess, but it, it feels like it's ours um, as residents of Crow's Nest because we use it so much. Um, yeah, okay, so now now I want to talk about more about the tourism and recreation sector and um, about Grassy Mountain. And I also want to talk about two different documents that I read in preparation for the Grassy Mountain hearing. Um, and I'm going to try really hard not to sound like an ad campaign from Crow's Nest, but I hope that I hope that this does inspire some people to come visit us. Um, we have lots, we have lots of good stuff happening. So I um, I moved away from Crow's Nest four years ago to go to college, and since then I've come back every summer to work, um, and I've now worked at six different restaurants in our town, and also in 2019 I worked at the uh, visitor center on the west end of Coleman um, where like I help people who are traveling through and it was so much fun and it was so exciting to get to see Crow's Nest through new eyes like fresh eyes um, and so the people so we help people who are traveling east and also people who are traveling west so people who are traveling east and entering into Alberta they would come into our into our visitor center and I would give my whole spiel like these are all the things you have to see in the next 30 kilometers like you can't miss this hiking trail you have to go see this waterfall. You have to go to my favorite restaurant. Don't forget to drive through the Frank side. You get to drive through history. Um, it was like, it was like, yeah, I just, I had to like vomit out all my favorite things about my town in the hopes that people would stop and get to see how beautiful it is because I know how beautiful it is. Um, and it was so exciting then to, to talk to people who are heading west or people who are leaving Alberta and they would come into the visitor center and they would almost give me the same speech back. Like they'd be like, well, have you been to this Russia? Well, have you done this trail? Like, of course I have, it's my time. But like, have you really, are you sure? Like, did you go to this museum though? And they were so excited to share with me all these new things that they discovered in our town and get to see kind of the pride in themselves that they discovered this hidden gem and the pride that they took the risk to come see Crow's Nest as opposed to Canmore or Banff or any of the more obvious like uh, tourism destinations um, and that definitely it was such a beautiful experience to work there because it was uh, validation that there are good things happening in our town and there is this momentum with tourism and recreation and it's not just like my hometown bias which is really cool um, and okay so yeah now I'm sorry now I'm talking about documents so uh, the first document I want to talk about is the socioeconomic impact assessment um, and this was like the purpose of this document is to show how the mine could benefit the community, but also how that uh, mine would neg negatively impact the community in terms of like our, yeah, the sense, our sense of community and also um, economically. 
And so we did get one thing right that we as a town are in a really, really difficult position um, financially. Like we have almost no industrial tax revenue and I don't envy the mayor and the, the council people in trying to figure out how we can kind of get out of this hole that was created because we are, uh, there's directly been a boom and bust um, local, like have we had a boom and bust local economy? Um, but I also, so then when I remember finishing reading the socioeconomic impact assessment and being so surprised that it was done and it was over and Heather also mentioned this, but it was, it felt incomplete and I was so shocked because all of the things that Heather described, the races, the volunteer organizations like View Rock, um, all of the activities, our relationship with the land, um, even like our farm or our community market that was started after I moved here and it's grown every single year and this is just wonderful every Thursday you know every year there's more and more artisans showing their products and all local um, and that wasn't that wasn't uh, mentioned in the impact assessment so all my favorite things about my town and all the things that I see that are blossoming in our town weren't represented and it's a scary thought because if it's not acknowledged in the impact assessment then the impact that the mine could give is also not going to be acknowledged um, and it was just, it was really disappointing and yeah again kind of scary, um, and I think in terms of natural resource extraction, because we've always been a, a coal mining town, we have this tunnel vision, and it's that kind of faulty logic of this is always we, what we've done in the past. This is what we have to do in the future. And there's even if you walk around town enough, you see these T-shirts that like we are a coal town, full stop. As if there's nothing else that can happen to us. Um, and so that brings me to the second document that I want to talk about, which is um, the letter that I read from the municipality to the panel of, um, in the, where they expressed their full support for Riversdale and for, um, sorry, for Riversdale, which is also Banga, and for the, the Grassy Mountain Project. And um, I remember they specifically used this word thriving to describe Bernie, Elkford, and Sparwood. And, you know, with this mine, we could also become thriving like them. And I definitely like stopped a second and I have I have a problem with how they use the word thriving. I think we have different definitions. Um, I'm sure in terms of like industrial tax revenue, Alfred and Farwood are definitely thriving. Like that's where, that's where tech is mainly located. Um, but in terms of thriving as in prosperity and the sense of community, the only town of those three that I would agree with that's thriving is Fernie. And that's because you walk through the main street and there's all these small shops and you get to explore the land with all these trails and people are just excited to be there. Like people love being in Fernie. And that's what I call thriving. Um, and I really think that is because of the tourism and recreation sector that's so big where it's, and it's lacking in Sparwood and Elfford completely. Um, and so I'm really disappointed in our municipality and this kind of blind optimism that we can have these parallel economies, that we can simultaneously have natural resource um, and the tourism sector together, working together, thriving together. That's, you, I, I understand that we want to have the best of both worlds, but that's not possible, especially with mining, especially with a mine that's delocated as Heather described so close to our town and the coal lodo is like, literally will be located across the highway from our Tim Hortons. I mentioned this in the in the Grassy Mountain hearing as well. And I just I just can't get over the fact that like you could be going through your drive through at Tim Hortons and like seeing the coal load out right there to blows my mind. Um and it just it feels extremely invasive and it definitely will threaten all the small businesses that Heather described. I completely agree with her. Um, and then I just kind of, I just want to broaden the scope, scope a bit and talk about the Eastern Slope. And I think the reason, the reason that I don't think we're, we're, ha we're not having these discussions about Fort McMurray and the tar sands with tourism and recreation is because it's so far up there, like no one's really going up there to vacation anyway. But the Eastern Slope, those are like right next to like Edmonton and Calgary, like the places where we're really, really concentrated with our population. And we use, like, we use these lands for so many of our activities. Like we have so much sentimental attachment to these lands. And if these coal mines come through, it's not out of sight, out of mind, like Fort McMurray is. And I really think it will change 
our identity in terms of, like, how, yeah, again, how we use the land and how we think of ourselves as Albertans and all the fun stuff that we get to do because of the access to the mountains that we have. And then I guess, yeah, my final, my final point is I really don't want to come back to Christmas Pass in my 40s and see that coal load out. And I assume Jim Hortons will still be there because I think Jim Hortons will always be there. But I really don't want to be 45 and going to the Jim Hortons drive through and seeing the coal load out. Um, yeah, okay. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. That was really powerful and <laughs> important points. I think if you and Heather have done anything tonight, it's it's uh, given us all a good reason to visit the crow's nest <laughs> with the beautiful images and there's just so much to do. And, and you're right, it will be entirely obvious if these coal developments go through, it's gonna have such a visible impact on the community. Um, so thank you so much for, for sharing that. And uh, I'm going to pass things off to our final speaker, Moira Williams, who is joining us uh, from the furthest away. <laughs> uh, she is a coal and climate activist in Brisbane, Australia, and for the past seven years has worked with local communities, with traditional owners and landholders on a campaign to impose uh, opening up of the Galilee Basin, which is one of the largest untapped coal reserves on the planet. Uh, so she is a co-founder and movement builder with Tipping Point, which is a small collective that works uh, behind the scenes to support the grassroots hashtag Stop Adani movement. Uh, so with that, I will pass it off to you, Moira. Awesome. Thank you. And thanks so much to be here um, and for the organizers for organizing. It's really interesting to hear um, the parallels, I guess, between your fight to protect such a beautiful place and the fight we've been having here. Um, first up, I wanted to acknowledge that I'm uh, coming to you today from stolen Aboriginal land, the land of the Yagara and Turrbal people. Um, acknowledge that no, so, uh, no treaty exists for them and there's an ongoing fight for land justice in this country. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And on that theme, yeah, I, I guess I also wanted to acknowledge that, you know, coal mining here has been a threat to Aboriginal land ever since the beginning of colonisation. So invasion and occupation was driven in part by the quest for coal and other resources. And here in Australia, we see Aboriginal people lead uh, resistance to coal projects um, broadly. We've also um, seen ongoing destruction of sacred Aboriginal sites. Um, for mining and here's one example is that you know almost 99% of applications to destroy cultural heritage for mines um, are approved and it's it, yeah just a travesty and we see an ongoing loss of um, First Nations culture and heritage to mining in Australia. Um, one of the other I guess for this talk, I was keen to provide a bit of context for coal mining in Australia and then go into a bit of a case study around the Galilee Basin, which is the area I've been working in most over the last sort of seven years. Um, this is a photo of our devastating bushfire crisis uh, uh, last summer. People might have seen some of the images projected around the world of people huddling like an, in apocalyptic scenes on beaches. Um, and so, you know, the, the climate crisis is well and truly here in Australia, one of the countries most impacted by the climate crisis. Um, but we're also the world, one of the world's biggest contributors to that. We are the world's biggest exporter of coal. Um, and, you know, we, we're exporting record volumes at the moment. We have around 94 operating coal mines um, and 60 proposed mining projects. And the Galley Basin, which I'll talk about shortly, is, uh, is, is the second largest proposed expansion of coal mining in the world. I mean, in terms of where that coal mining takes place, so these are the two eastern states of Australia. I'm based in Brisbane, just there in Queensland. Um, that's where we have most of our coal, uh, our coking coal mined from, and then a lot of our thermal coal is mined in the state of New South Wales. Um, and shipped out among those ports out through in Queensland, in the case of across the Great Barrier Reef, largely to Asia. Um, you know, just like everywhere else, and it was, you know, important to hear that the impacts of coal mining, you all have locally, obviously here as well, and across the world, we know coal is harming communities. So we know that about 3,000 Australians die from air pollution in Australia each year. That's largely caused by pollution from the mining and burning of coal. Um, in Australia, we are leading the world in mammal extinction. 
Um, and we're also seeing our precious Great Barrier Reef um, suffer again and again from mass bleaching events that are being driven by the mining and burning of coal. Um, I guess, uh, it, you know, coal mining here, as is everywhere, is a huge user of water. You know, 385 billion litres of wa water a year, um, the same as 5 million people's domestic use. So it's a huge user. This train, this um, picture of the train is an interesting story. At the, um, at the height of our 2019 drought, when the rest of us were on water restrictions, um, two trains full of water each day were being shipped up to a, even a, just a small coal mine in the middle of the Blue Mountains just to keep a small coal mine going. So, you know, water precious in such a dry continent is being used to, you know, wash um, dirty coal. Um, in terms of, you know, where our coal is, what's it being used for? The vast majority of it is exported to Asia. Um, and they're the sort of percentages there where our coal is exported to. Um, interestingly and, and promisingly, I guess, we are seeing those countries um, start to introduce coal phase-out policies. Um, Japan is looking to shut down, announced shutting down, I think it was over 100 coal plants. China announced peak emissions by 2030. Um, and this means the demand for Australian coal is in decline. And we as a country should be beginning to transition away from coal. Unfortunately, um, you know, despite that reality, the reality that coal is becoming unviable, the world is moving away from it as we kind of bring ourselves in line with the Paris Climate Agreements. Um, we have folks like this guy in power, um, Scott Morrison, our Prime Minister, who proudly wielded a lump of coal in Parliament, um, holding it up and saying it will not hurt us. Um, do not be afraid. Um, so there has become a big, um, you know, there's become a big ideological debate around coal and its uh, use in Australia. Um, and, you know, mining companies have a big influence over our politics. As I imagine they do that, you know, they, in, in your country, they spend tens of millions of dollars on advertising and lobbying. Um, two years ago, they spent almost $2 million in donations to the major parties. Um, we have a Murdoch-owned media here that continue to sort of perpetuate climate denialism and, you know, refuse to acknowledge any links between climate change and, you know, the extreme impacts of bushfire like we saw last summer. Um, so despite, like, all um, common sense, the science, um, both state and federal governments are actively promoting and expanding coal and gas mining and exports. Um, and trying to cut environmental protections. Um, in terms of the, I'm um, kind of, so that's a bit of context um, and it's a bit of context as to kind of why something as crazy as the Galilee Basin Coal Project even still exists. Um, and I'm keen to dig into, you know, what that campaign's looked like over the last sort of seven to eight years. Um, so this is a, a <laughs> Hopefully we can send you the slides and you can dig into this diagram more. It's a little bit messy, but it's the best one I could find. That's the Galilee Basin um, Thermal Coal Basin, about 300 kilometres inland um, from the Queensland coastline. Um, that is the Great Barrier Reef in the shaded area. Um, and 10 years ago, we first got wind of plans of coal companies and governments colluding to massively expand and open up this coal basin and ship that coal out through those what would be new and expanded coal ports along the Great Barrier Reef coastline. Um, we, there's some key players in this in coal basin, um, some of which will be familiar. Gautam Adani, the Indian billionaire in the Adani group. Clive Palmer, look at him, isn't he a great fella? He's just um, started his own political party as well in Australia. And, and mining magnate, um, Gina Reinhardt. Um, so these are the, the major players. Um, about four years ago, it became clear that most of the Australian companies interested in the coal basin um, weren't really progressing the, this project because of the economic un unviability of it, because it was so expensive to build that 300 kilometer railway line. Um, and so what we've seen over the years is 
company after company pull out of the project um, because there were up to nine mega mines proposed and Adani sort of being the last man standing and pushing ahead with his Carmichael coal project, which is a 60 million tonne coal mine. Um, it's actually a mega mine, so it'd be six underground coal mines, six open cut coal mines, 40 miles long um, and 25 miles wide. Um, the good news is if I go back to that um, first slide, you know, broadly our campaign to stop this industrialization of the Great Barrier Reef has been hugely successful. We've stopped all major planned expansions and new coal ports across the Great Barrier Reef. Um, but the bad news is that Adani has been persistent and dogged and is currently in the first stages of um, construction of their Carmichael project. Um, some of the impacts I was keen to talk to, like a lot of the ones, you know, it's so heartening to hear you talk about, I guess, First Nations people and tourism sector combining in, to oppose the coal projects there. Um, a lot of the similar concerns are present here, obviously, um, the First Nations rights of the traditional owners of the area. Um, climate, you know, this is a huge carbon bomb, 4.6 billion tonnes of carbon pollution in our atmosphere if the whole basin was opened up. Um, the Great Barrier Reef, um, we would see if this project went ahead, you know, 500 more coal ships traveling through the Great Barrier Reef every year. And, and as I've talked about, huge amounts of water used of precious water in Queensland, one of the more drier states of Australia. So I guess in response to all these concerns, um, you know, not soon after we sort of heard about these projects and learned more about them, a massive community campaign formed. It was made up of um, you know, tourism operators on the Great Barrier Reef that were concerned about these impacts. Um, it was made up of um, traditional owners that were concerned about the impacts from the Juru people and the Wangan and Jagalingu people um, and people in cities and towns that were concerned about this precious icon of our reef being damaged by these ridiculous projects. Um, one of the first resistors to the culture projects were the Wangan and Jagalingu people, um, the traditional owners of the land where the mine is being built. Um, and since 2012, they've said no to the mine. Um, they've concerned a lot about the damage it will do to their country um, and their songlines. And um, Adani have responded in a very aggressive manner. Um, they've bankrupted Elder Adrian Baragaba, who's pictured in the photo there, um, banned him and his son, Cody from practicing culture on their country. Um, and the state Queensland government has extinguished their native title claim over parts of the country without ever consulting them. Right now their um, fight to, to protect country continues. And this is a photo taken two weeks ago where Cody um, led a hundred people as part of a cycle for country into the mine site. Um, so yeah, there's ongoing resistance from lots of communities to this project, um, but we are of course up against a pretty big opponent. Um, and in Australia, as I said, uh, the, the politics is totally captured um, by the mining industry. This is a photo of our premier in Queensland, Anastasia Palisades, shaking hands with the Dani. And over the years, they've rolled out several special deals um, that make the opening of this, what would otherwise be unviable project economically possible. So that comes in the form of, you know, royalty free holidays that amount to a $700 million public subsidy. At one point, the government was looking to hand them a billion dollars to help build the railway line. Um, our movement successfully stopped that loan going ahead. Um, you know, anything from ongoing subsidies to building roads and, of course, extinguishing native title to pave the way for these big mining companies. Um, and, of course, the main defence of their, of pushing ahead and supporting these projects is the jobs and the economy. And we know that um, Adani and other mining companies lie around the actual direct benefits that are um, delivered. And we know over time that, um, you know, Adani sort of said they were going to deliver 10,000 jobs to the region and they um, admitted in court that it was more like 1,200 jobs. So there's an ongoing narrative in Australia about the mining industry being the backbone of the economy. Um, and it's our job as a movement to um, unpick those 
myths and um, yeah, show what's at risk if these projects go ahead. Um, about four years ago when the, um, it was clear that Adani was sort of, as I said, the last man standing, um, we launched the Stop Adani movement. So um, this is a picture of a photo of one of our big days of action where communities across the country made human signs. Um, we kicked it off with a national roadshow that launched over a hundred local Stop Adani groups in their community. Um, and this has been, you know, a, yeah, a really amazing movement and one of probably the biggest social movements in Australia's history. Um, through a huge amount of grassroots actions over the last four years from film screenings to office actions, uh, to big human slimes like this one, to door knocking and rallies, um, we've made successfully made Adani a household name and the Stop Adani movement has become a symbol of the community fight against coal. Um, we in fact made the name Adani so toxic that the company was forced to rebrand itself as Bravas. Um, everyone else, we still call them Adani, we still call ourselves a Stop Adani movement. Um, uh, but yeah, that is a symbol of just how toxic we've made their brand. Um, in terms of some of the key strategies we've used to oppose these projects and um, you know, it's been a decade now of community resistance to this, this coal projects. Um, Adani first said they were gonna get coal out of the ground in 2014. It's now 2021. Um, they haven't dug a single, single lump of coal. So we've successfully delayed the project for seven years. And that's been through a huge diversity of strategies and tactics, really everything at our disposal to stop it. Um, in the early days that look, looked a lot like um, scrutinizing and challenging any of their approvals in any way we could. Um, we then shifted tack to a huge um, campaign targeting their investors and financiers. Uh, we were successful in pushing sort of four of Australia's major banks and many of the global banks to rule out investing in the project and that's forced Adani to self-finance the project. Um, more recently, a number of groups have been targeting their contractors, um, engineering firms, subcontractors that build the project. And by forcing them out of the project, that has meant that they've had to build it in a much more slower and riskier way. Um, there's also been a frontline camp, a blockade camp up on site that's been running for the last four years, disrupting work on site and playing a really important role to monitor any breaches on the ground and exposing exposing that. Um, just recently, we reached the milestone of 100, forcing 100 companies to say no to Adani and refuse to work out, rule out work on the project. Um, as I said, that includes major banks, engineering firms, contractors, and as a result, we forced Adani to self-finance. Oh, I said that. Um, our recent focus has actually been on insurance and we've been targeting a number of companies um, that are in the Lloyds of London insurance marketplace, sort of a last ditch effort for insurance. Um, and as part of that campaign, working with UK climate campaigners, um, we successfully forced the Lloyds of London to introduce their first climate policy, which looked at phasing out um, insuring thermal coal mines by 2022. And there's some loopholes in that policy, but um, broadly we think this is highly significant because Lloyd's ensures 40% of the world's fossil fuel projects. Um, and we're starting to see an impact of that work on insurance on the ground. Um, BMD is one of Adani's major contractors. They're starting to, they are actively building the mine at the moment. Um, but there was some news this week that our work on insurance and folks targeting BMD directly has meant that the company is actually acting without insurance. Um, so we're at a stage now where we're continuing to force companies to walk away from the project. We're hoping to make it, uh, you know, as difficult, as costly, as highly reputational, high risk to companies' reputations to the point where we can force Adani to walk away from this unviable project. Um, to finish off, I just wanted to touch base on a couple of key ingredients to success, I guess, of the style of campaigning we've been using. And um, we've been really fortunate to have, you know, a number of resourced, you know, paid campaigners working on this campaign. I'm one of those, um, but there has been a, a great degree of collaboration and coordination across 
the uh, alliance of groups and organisations working on this, many of with you know, different reasons, they're part of that fight. Um, we've also used a directed network approach, which means a centralised strategy, but decentralised implementation by local groups on the ground. And my role at Tipping Point has been making sure um, those groups are connected with each other, provided with resources and information. Um, and we've invested in that grassroots power building to make this, you know, a, a national movement. I think I'm at time, but I guess I wanted to finish on a, on a high note and say that, um, yeah, ultimately we are, you know, change is coming. Most Australians think we need to get out of coal as soon as possible. Um, profit and finance is getting harder for these projects and we know that community action is working. Um, 10 years ago, the Australian mining industry had plans to build the equivalent of 10 mega mines, but only the equivalent of one has started construction and the rest is being stalled or abandoned. So yeah, people power is, is working and uh, yeah, big solidarity to all of you in your ongoing fight. Um, thanks very much. Thank you, Moira. That was amazing. And it is, it is, it's incredibly encouraging to hear that you've been able to keep coal in the ground and that you've been able to delay projects for seven years. That's something that's inspirational for us over here in Alberta. Uh, so with the end of your presentation, uh, I am now going to bring us into uh, the last part of our evening, which is our panel discussion period. So uh, Stephanie, Heather, Latasha, I'm gonna invite you back if you'd like to turn your cameras on uh, for just a brief question period. I know we're, we're kind of reaching the end of our night here, uh, but maybe I'll start with a question for you, Moira, just because you've, you've talked to us about all of these ingredients for success and this is something that we're really trying to work and mobilize on the ground as much as we can. Uh, but I was curious um, about how you forced, you know, a hundred companies to say no to Adani. Um, you know, uh, how is it exactly that you're doing this? Is it, is it, you know, tipping point approaching them directly? Is it part of the myth busting where you're saying, you know, the information that Adani's providing about the economic benefits isn't actually legitimate or is it really that damage to their reputation that this is going to be such an unpopular decision uh, with Australians into their brand. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think it's really going like one making Adani toxic as a brand and as reputationally. Um, so it's been a long work of storytelling and telling about the, the gross, I mean, they're a terrible company. They've had human rights abuses, environmental um, breaches all over the world. So telling that story was really important. Um, and then I would say like one by one directly just picking those companies off one by one. And I think that's important. Like we are, have limited resources. Mm -hmm. So part of our role was to work with groups like Market Forces who were doing the research on which companies are most important to this project going ahead. If mm -hmm. we can pull them out, it will hurt the company. And then, you know, pointing all of your grassroots firepower at those companies. So when we went after the banks, the four big banks, we didn't go after all four at once. We picked one and we put, you know, all of our energy and effort into that included, you know, sit-ins in banks, all targeting with the aim of that pressure would then create a domino effect among the others. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's, um, Powerful to be able to do that and make the most of your resources, especially since I know that, you know, here in Alberta too, we're, we're largely working off of a lot of voluntary movements with a lot of NGOs, uh, folks who are just working within communities with the time that they have. And so kind of being really uh, deliberate about how you're targeting those companies and then watching them fall definitely does have an impact on, on the companies who are putting out these massive coal proposals. Uh, so the next question I'll direct towards uh, Heather and Stephanie. Um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm kind of, I'm thinking about the, the recreation and tourism industry. Um, actually, I think there was a question in the chat, but is, is there anywhere that we can find like a directory of all of the outdoor businesses that are located within the crow's nest so that we're able to connect with them? And um, maybe Heather, do you know if anyone has started to do an economic assessment of the, the actual tourism value that's being generated out of the crow's nest pass? really good question. I find that it's um, kind of challenging to get the like actual of tourism um, because people will stop one place, spend money there, and then stop somewhere else and spend money there. 
like go and grab a coffee. So I think that there are calculations out there that that do kind of an assessment such as that. that. Um, but one thing that's really lacking in this community is really beneficial data that will actually showcase that information. So, so no, not, not that I know of. And that's something that I find really frustrating because we can't go and pull that information. And um, like with our local municipality, I thought that they would have, personally, I thought that they would have taken a little bit more initiative to figure out some of this. Um, but some of the things that I hear from the, our council members, for example, is saying, or is they'll hear that someone has said industry and tourism can work together. But what that looks like, and, and I would even say that, I, or, and when I say industry, I say, I mean, resource extraction. Um, I say like, yeah, I, I would say resource extraction and tourism can work together, but not on this scale, not what we are seeing right now. Um, so there's not really much thought being put into it. There's not, there is not really any good information out there, even with the socioeconomic side of it. Um, like our municipality did one survey and it was really like, it kind of skimmed on the, on the topic of do people want coal mines or do they not want coal mines, but it never really actually asked that direct question. And, and like it asked a question, like, do you think that the two can exist? And I mean, I would have even answered yes to that question, right? So they're now saying, oh, the majority of people here want coal mines. I'm sorry, I'm starting to go off topic. But yes, yeah, so the point of it is, and your question was, is there an economic assessment? No, not to my knowledge, there is nothing, which it would be nice to actually have it. And I think the other question you had was, is there a list of outdoor recreational? Um, again, <laughs> there is and there isn't like, we have a local, um, cause, okay, so there is a, so in tourism, there's usually something called a DMO, a destination marketing oper operator. Um, and this region has not had one. Um, and it's usually a regional based thing. So they, they are create, there is one being created right now with, um, uh, with, <laughs> sorry, I'm just reading one of the questions. Um, there is one with uh, Pincher Creek and Curzon's Pass that's being developed right now. And then that will kind of bring everyone together under one umbrella where someone like from Calgary or Edmonton or whatever, if they want to find out something to do, they can go there. Right now there is a website called Go Crow's Nest, but I would say that it's, um, it's only as good as what people put into it. And a lot of the operators around here haven't put their information into it. Um, and then I also see someone said, check your economic development department. Ha, huh, again, we do not have one of those. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Heather. Um, oh, Stephanie, you look like you have a comment. Yeah, um, there is, we do have a pretty good um, like visitor guide. Like it's not exhaustive, but like we have like, a good paper version. I know like, the, I think it's a chamber of commerce that does it, um, mm -hmm. but it's not like, it's not a directory. Um, and I also, I thought Heather might mention it. I don't know the exact numbers, but I know that Brian Gallant, who runs the Sinister Seven, this the big race, he'd done an, um, like an economic assessment and there is some sort of number. I don't know how accurate it is. I don't even know how you'd calculate it, but he was, he does have a number that shows like the, the spillover impacts of his race specifically. Um, so I think maybe like in there's been like more independent attempts to calculate the benefit of tourism, like for their specific projects where you don't have anything big. I don't know, if, maybe Heather, I don't know if you remember the exact numbers, but it... um, I know what I know what you're talking about, Stephanie. I think that there it was over one million dollars that brought into the community just in the one weekend of that race. Um, I think like 1.3 million or something like that. And it is a calculation that tourism uses. And I can't remember everything that goes into it, but it's, it's basically like evaluating the, the amount of rooms and um, assuming that so many people are eating out and whatnot and things like that. So that goes into that calculation. And it is, it's a, it's a huge number just from that one, one race with, mm -hmm. I think there's 3000 people that come here for that. So it's, 
Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I feel I feel like um, yeah, we're really starting to see like the crow's nest be this burgeoning community. See it looking something similar to maybe one day like a Canmore <laughs> or or a Banff, but it's it's still unique in its own way. And and especially when we have initiatives going in the province, like the the two million uh, dollars that Alberta uh, tourism would like to see spent. Uh, by 2030. How are we supposed to quantify that when we're not having something like an economic assessment done for the Crow's Nest Pass? And so I'm, I'm really seeing the gap there. Um, maybe I'll, I'll throw a question uh, to Latasha next. Um, I'm, I'm just interested if you could uh, just give us a, a little bit of a description about what uh, Nitsitipi has been up to this year and, and maybe some of the ways that we um, as other people in Treaty 7 can help to support your initiatives. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I can speak to that. You can hear me okay? Yeah, <laughs> sound great. Gave out on me. Um, so there's a lot. And I think when going back to my presentation, we are all treaty people. Um, if you're situated in Alberta, there's three different kind of treaty areas. So Treaty 6, Treaty 7, and Treaty 8. Um, and really looking into that. What does it mean to be in good treaty relations? Treaty relations don't just mean the relationships that we have between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. Negotiated in those treaties um, was the consideration of the land and water and landscapes and animals that all reside in those areas as well. So as our role as treaty people is to really honor that life and to spend that time um, self-educating yourself on what that means. There's a lot of really great resources out there to get that information about what are your obligations as treaty people, because we are all treaty people. It's not just First Nations who have these extra rights or have these extra things awarded to them. That's not how it works. Um, so I encourage people on this call to do a little bit of that self um, education and educating what that means. Um, and so that when we say things like the depth of a European, European plow of what was negotiated in treaty, that's all that was negotiated of how much of the land we would share. And like I'd mentioned earlier, coal and other um, resources lie way beneath that. <laughs> Therefore, by honoring treaty and upholding those rights or upholding those agreements as they were meant to be upheld, these areas are protected. And the reasons that we negotiated those types of things, um, the way that they're listed, such as in, in treaty, is for the protection because we knew the sacredness of these areas. And sacred being used as a really liberal term our elders um, and knowledge keepers way back then knew that these areas were very important, um, not only from a cultural and spiritual sense, but from a, um, a science base as well. Western science is now only catching up to why these areas such as watersheds and the, the headwaters are so important and why these things, how they all, the interconnectedness and how they work together. And all of that kind of information, a great gateway into that again is going back to treaty, going back and reading um, what are some of these Indigenous worldviews? So again, some great books to recommend are The True Spirit of Intent of Treaty 7, which is a great book to read. It's a long book, um, and it actually includes elder perspectives from across Treaty 7. There's also um, Black Foot Ways of Knowing by Betty Bastine, which also um, provides an introductory to an Indigenous worldview and connections to land. Um, and you'll quickly start to realize that when we talk about connections to land, it is, it's so much more than just having a strong connection. It really is tied to, to all of your being and all of your identity. And I know that lots of you on this call feel that, which is why you feel this connection to these places. And it's how do we honor that and keep that connection alive. Um, so in terms of ways to support um, self-education and advocacy is a really great way to go. We do have some more tangible things such as you can go to our website. We do have a website, um, this is viewwaterprotectors.com, where we do try to post action items. So one of the long-standing ones we have is our postcard campaign regarding the Grassy Mountain Coal Project, where um, it's all online. You put in your name, your postal code, um, and one of our team sends a postcard on your behalf to Minister Wilkinson, urging him to reject that project. Um, like I said, we have things that pop up on there. We've been up to a lot from anything from the petition and regional assessments to really being engaged on the back end and kind of in the forefront media space of things. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. Sounds like it's been a really busy year and thank you so much for sharing those resources. I'd actually, uh, once we get to posting uh, this recording on albertawilderness.ca, I'll share some links uh, to Nitsitipi as well as those books that you mentioned, uh, The True Spirit of Intent of Treaty 7, Blackfoot Ways of Knowing, because I think that education component is really uh, an important step for all of us as treaty peoples is to, to take the time to sit down and to consider uh, you know, what are our responsibilities and how can we be part of this bigger community, which is, is the large theme which we're coming back to tonight. So uh, thank you, thank you, thank you to our panel speakers. I know this was a little bit of a short panel discussion, uh, but I, I see that we're kind of at 8.05 here. Uh, so I just want to say once again, you know, your expertise tonight is so valuable. Your perspectives from all of these different communities that you're part of is really meaningful to these larger conversations we're having around coal and what we can actually do uh, to make a meaningful change. Uh, so with that, I am going to just say one more thanks quickly first to our audience. Uh, you have been amazing. Thank you for all of your questions. I'm sorry that we didn't get to all of them. Um, but first I'll start by saying uh, thank you as well to uh, the Coal Policy Working Group. So you have been Amazing. I know that some of you are on this call tonight in just mobilizing and organizing and making sure that this issue really stays in the light here in Alberta. Um, so you can see their logos on the screen there. Feel free to give them a little bit of attention and a little bit of love. Um, and now I am going to pass things off to Ian Urquhart, uh, who is AWA's Conservation Director, and he has uh, an important message about some upcoming dates, especially for the Grassy Mountain Coal Project. So do you want to <laughs> bring things home tonight, Ian, and, and give us some closing messages. Thanks. Ian, you'll have to unmute yourself. We can't quite hear you yet. Mute. Sorry. There you are. <laughs> Sorry about that. So oh, can right. you see this, Grace? Can you see this? Yes. Okay. We can All see right. your screen, Ian. I, I just want to begin by reiterating what Grace said and uh, just thanking all the participants tonight, uh, both the presenters and, uh, and the audience. I think this is a totally brilliant evening, and I think we can learn a great deal from what um, from what we from what we heard this evening, and I I wish some decision makers were listening to this tonight, and that they would take what we heard this evening to heart. Um, uh, one of the things I wanted to say here is just to to borrow a phrase from an escapist television series that I'm indulging myself in when I'm not dealing with coal these days. Everything is connected, and and. And, and I think tonight, the discussion of communities, the notion of thinking about communities in all sorts of ways underlines that, and underlines the fact that all the communities represented here this evening have a connection to the land, important connection to the land, and want to see our place on the land uh, take place and our activities on the land take place in a way that ensures a sustainable livelihood, not just for us, but for uh, but for future generations. The Gen Z people like Stephanie, I think are far too polite. Um, who, gave, who gave my generation the right to decide their future when it comes to areas of Alberta like the Crow's Nest? Um, with respect to how interconnected things are, I just wanted to give you this quote that was in the last issue of our magazine, came from a member of the Kanai First Nation who was talking about the solidarity that exists between so many interests and communities when it comes to the future of the crow's nest. Um, this was part of what they said during their public uh, comment on the grassy hearing. Cowboy hats, mountaineers, environmental groups, climate change activists, politicians, indigenous peoples, First Nations. This is who we are. It was never outright spoken, but it is the essence of all of us unified. And I think if we're going to beat this, that's what we have to be, whether we're focusing on government, whether we're focusing on corporations, whether we're just focusing on friends and neighbors to try to get them involved. So what I want to end with is a reminder. Today's May the 18th. One month, people. One month until the deadline 
for the submission of the joint review panel report on Grassy Mountain. Okay, June eighteenth is their is 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 their deadline. Uh, we only have one month until that time until that deadline, and it's time for all of us to spend time thinking about how we can mobilize friends, neighbors, acquaintances to get involved. And when that report comes out, whether it says no to Grassy or whether it says yes to Grassy with conditions, that we are ready, that we are there to put pressure on Federal Minister Wilkinson to say no to this project. Uh, so the slide here, there's his contact information, uh, his email address on the Hill in Parliament, his telephone number, his fax number, his mailing address. And what I've been encouraging people I've been talking to about this is think of five friends or pick on your family. I mean, pick on five, pick on five friends and acquaintances and get them to commit to, uh, to contacting Wilkinson uh, once the joint review panel report is submitted. You know, this is, this is a fight that I really believe we can win. This is a fight for grass for for that. This is a fight against Grassy, against this project that I really think we can win. And part of that comes from just the incredible outpouring of opposition to Grassy that you saw during the public hearing. There were 4,411 separate individual comments about Grassy posted on the Impact Assessment Agency's registry. Uh, we know that because one of our volunteers went through and cataloged them all for us here at AWA. 98% of those comments were opposed to Grassy Mountain. Only 69 comments on that registry out of 4,411 supported the project. And I think we just have to amplify that message to federal politicians like Wilkinson uh, to stop this madness, to stop this ecological and cultural madness that is the future that these coal companies want to bring to places like the crow's nest. I just want to say one other thing and then I'll, I'll, I'll sign off for tonight. But I really believe that stopping coal is just the first step. I mean, this is only the first step in this campaign. I mean, I heard Latasha talk about types of jobs. I heard Heather talk about sustainable economic driver for uh, the crow's nest, what that is. I mean, the questions that you're talking about, you know, why don't we have, why, why don't we have the sort of regional economic assessment that takes a serious look at the contributions? of these industries to the livelihoods of people in the crow's nest. Stopping coal is only the first step. What we have to insist that our governments do in the aftermath of stopping a project like Grassy is engage with First Nations on, on enabling First Nations to look for and search for other sustainable economic opportunities for their members. That's an important goal to my mind in what reconciliation is supposed to be about. And, and similarly, when it comes to something like just the past generally, I think governments have that obligation. I mean, have that obligation to assist communities to try to find more sustainable ways of living. So anyways, thank you so much for uh, your attention tonight. Thank you so much again to the participants. Uh, for sharing their insights with us this evening. Uh, stay well and remember, June the 18th is only a month away. So dragoon those friends and acquaintances into the campaign to hit Wilkinson hard with emails and telephone calls and faxes once that joint review panel reports released. Anyways, from AWA, thanks so much for being part of this evening. Take care. Thanks everyone. And with that being said, uh, good night to all.